Do you want the microphone? I think, is this on? Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, your talk. I, w I had a question. So do you have any suggestions as far as for, for people who have been diagnosed with uh, bipolar or manic depressive? Um, do you have any suggestions on what they could do outside of the drug-related therapy? It, well, it depends what sort of bipolar or manic depression. So for people who have classical manic depression, um, who have these episodes of mania, I think they need to have treatment or, or be in a safe place when they have their manic episode and be looked after and some sedative drugs of, of one sort or another um, are probably helpful because often people just don't sleep for you know days or weeks at a time. Um, and then I think it's a case of trying to help people identify when they might be getting another episode. And, and usually over time, as people get older, they, they get better at identifying when an episode's coming on and finding ways of dealing with it. Um, so if it's that sort of bipolar disorder, that's what I think needs to happen. As I said, the, the label is now applied to all sorts of people, and it really um, making recommendations about people who have a different sort of condition, I think, is an individual thing. You, you need to look at what sort of problems they have and, and how else they can deal with them. And it might be, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people do have trouble managing intense emotions. Uh, I worked with, I worked um, for, for a few years with, with addicts and, you know, a lot of people are using opiates or alcohol or all sorts of other things to avoid feeling how they really actually feel. Um, and, you know, I, I, think, I, I, I think all you can say about that is, you know, learning how to cope with our emotions and, and uh, where they've come from it can, can, it is, is not a quick fix. It can't be done overnight. It's something that people need to, to learn probably over years and probably using lots of different techniques, maybe therapy, but maybe many other things too. I think there was some... Oh, oh sorry, have you got... Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, because from what I saw, you, you get into a lot of studies, and you, you know, a lot of these studies had numbers and everything. Just want to know, how is it considered, the studies, with a person's diet, and how, what's their lifestyle? You know, are they being treated psychologically you know, to try to calm down, or are they just given drugs? Sugar, is that still uh, considered as part of these studies? And, what the actual lifestyle of the person is before they start interacting yeah, yeah, yeah. with, with a, a medication. Yeah, so, so no, th none of those things are considered in any of these studies. Um, and I, I don't know any research that's been done, well, much research, because I think there is some on omega-3, but I, I think there's very little research into diet and the effect of diet on mental health problems. There is good research on exercise, uh, there's quite a few studies on the role of exercise in depression, and exercise is easily as effective as antidepressants for, uh, for most cases of depression. Uh, there's a lady down here. And then there were some hands over there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when did they stop administering electric shock therapy in England? And are they still doing it today here? And is it voluntary or can it be given involuntarily? So it's still given in England, yeah. Um, but, uh, but the latest guidelines, which came out probably, probably about 10 years ago now, did make it much more difficult to give it, um, to give it against people's will. So it's not given very often against people's will anymore in England. I don't know the situation in the States, but I do hear that it's used, it's used more commonly here, partly because it's a sort of quick form of treatment that, um, that, that, that health insurance companies might like, because you, know, you can say, okay, you can have 10 weeks of that, and then it's done. I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know whether there's an association with heart attacks. Um, I, I mean, the main side effect we hear about is loss of memory, which was always said to be temporary and not really very significant, but actually there's, there's a lot of evidence that, that it can be permanent for some people, and some people it's really very distressing and, and horrible. I think there was some, some sort of in the middle over there. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you again for your talk. Very informative and enlightening. Um, are you familiar with the work of what Dr. Amen does? He, um, and also as it relates to instead of um, his philosophy is looking more at um, nutrition, food, and, and that instead of um, using drugs or looking at cluster of symptoms. He's ones that will look at, are you familiar with his work? No, no. sorry. It, it, they will look at um, brain scans. It's a spec scan. And yes, so they're yes, looking I've at the yes, brain. Yes, instead of yes. just looking at symptoms, they're looking at the brain mm -hmm. and they're seeing mm -hmm. blood flow and brain activity and making it. But I, I just, you know, what's your take on, obviously you're saying there's limited studies about nutrition as it, they've said exercise has been proven, but nutrition, food, and supplements helping as another route versus the um, synthetic, you know, chemical drugs. I, I, I'm sorry, it's not really my area. Um, all I would say is that, you know, I think it's really important that people eat well and healthily. It's part of looking after yourself, and that's part of what is going to improve your mental health and, and, and help and help you, yeah, and give you confidence and self-esteem. There was there was a man over there. He's had his hand up for a while. Um, and then a, a lady in front of him, and then, sorry, yes, some people around there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming today. Um, it seems like we're, we're just all addicted to drugs, whether it be coffee or uh, sugar. This gentleman was speaking about sugar, and um, I'm a little bit in that field with the alcoholism. Uh, and it seems like, to me, a lot of alcoholics and drug addicts, they love highs, whether it's coffee, carbs, and there is a mood swing. There's an extreme mood swing. So it's, it, we like to be in another place in our mind, and they need to do a lot more studies in this area because um, it all turns to sugar. Carbs turn to sugar. So I want sugar, you know, I want this high. I want to go in another place. So they need to do a lot more studies in this area because it's really, it's, it just also speaks on uh, how much corruption there is with, with monies in this, this whole, you, you know, this, this whole s system. It's all corrupt. So um, there's, thank there's you a very quote, much. There's a quote by Aldous Huxley, a brilliant quote, um, which goes something like, um, uh, we, we all want to have chemical vacations from the intolerable reality of our lives. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's true. Um, and I think the way to reduce the damage of those chemical vacations is, is first of all, to realize what we're doing and to try and do it as harmlessly as possible. And, and secondly, to try and reduce the intolerable reality around us to try and build up lives that are actually, that are better, that we don't need to escape from quite as much. Where's the mic gone? There was um, there's some people around there. There's, there's a lady there who's had her hand up for a while. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, watching this as a parent of a young adult who was diagnosed with bipolar um, is very depressing. <laughs> um, but um, I finally, we finally have found what we felt as, you know, drugs that have helped my daughter um, reduce a lot of the suicidal thoughts and I'm feeling now with like she's doing the Prozac and the lithium and Abilify Obviously, when I first started to put her on that, you, you just you, you cringe at the thought of giving your child, no matter how old they are, anything that may harm them. And I do see the adverse, you know, effects that you talk about. But um, besides the therapy, and um, you know, she struggled with going off them constantly because of the uh, the effects. And um, it's a, it's sad to see what is going on you know, in her mind and how she constantly would say, I don't know why I feel this way. But what, as a parent, you know, I, and she, I said, this isn't a life sentence, you know, I hope that mm -hmm. she'll be able to mm -hmm. get off the drugs. Mm -hmm. But again, what is, personally, what, if she was a patient of yours, um, what would you suggest? She is doing the, um, the pills, she is doing the therapy and the group therapy. What, what would be something else that you would suggest? 
that would be helpful? Well, um, you know, I think sometimes I think sometimes people do feel that they're getting some benefit in a crisis out of, of drug treatment. And I don't think there's any point then sort of making them feel bad about it or forcing them to stop. I think it's then important that people do other things like, like therapy. I suppose trying to, you know, trying to deal with what was wrong in life and, and make that right again. And then hopefully when they're in a better place they can start to come off and that's what I you know sometimes you have to take the focus away from the drug treatment actually for a while stop worrying about it get other things in place and then as you say what's really important is is for people not to feel that this has to be forever um, and always to feel that you know there will come a time when 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 they will be in a place where they, they can reduce but not to feel that they have to do that immediately if that if, if they don't feel they're ready for it much in the mental health profession um, I'm currently treating a lot of patients for different diagnoses and um, I just wanted to see if there was any studies that you had seen that the effects or long-term effects of these diagnoses as far as depression or anxiety with the within the, the um, aspects of the medical problems that people can have exhibit for example like anxiety you know attributing to heart disease and heart attacks because there are symptoms that the patient will have as far as like the, 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 the heart rate beating fast, um, you know, sweaty palms, the entire uh, physiological symptoms of a person changes once they do have different symptoms of anxiety and depression. So I'm just wondering if there are any studies out there that show any correlation with, um, with uh, physical illness. Um, the, the, yes, the, there are high correlations between having um, particularly chronic physical illnesses and depression, um, probably between heart disease and anxiety, but I couldn't swear on that. It just sort of seems to make sense, doesn't it? Um, but certainly there, there are studies showing the, the co the, the, you know, the coexistence of physical diseases and depression. Um, it's, it's been another sort of area for marketing antidepressants, you know, targeting people in, in hospitals. Um, Whereas, of course, you can understand if people have got chronic physical conditions that they're more likely to be depressed. They're less likely to be able to do the things that previously made them happy. Um, so I I'm, don't think that antidepressants are a logical answer, but that's, that's how it's been approached. Where's the mic gone? Hi. Uh, yeah, a lot of this, um, these antidepressants, they're, one of their main side effects is suicidal tendencies. And some of these uh, mass shooters that have been happening have been on these antidepressants. Yeah, um, so I mentioned that briefly. Um, so they do seem to, in, uh, I would say in a relatively small proportion of people, but it's more common in younger people apparently, cause this sort of state of agitation and tension and that can be associated with suicidal feelings and with aggression. And there's, there's just one one big review that's been done recently that's highlighted the link with aggression. Um, it's always difficult in the case of an individual who does something to know whether it was the antidepressants or whether the problem was there before and that's why they were prescribed antidepressants. But, these, but studies that have looked at randomised trials have, have shown that these suicidal thoughts and aggressive tendencies are more common, slightly more common in people taking the antidepressants compared to people taking the placebo. You know, again, it might be very rare, but obviously it's a very, very serious side effect. And, and, um, and if, if it's true, as I'm saying, that really these drugs don't have any benefit, I feel that, that you know, that's enough that we should really stop using them. I can't remember. The, this lady over here in the pink cardigan has had her hand up for quite a long time. <laughs> um. I have two questions. One is about SSRIs. Um, what is your not, I've been told, because uh, I'm on one of them, about having bone loss. And as if you stay on them consistently, consistently, does the bone loss continue to get worse? I'm really sorry, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the research on bone loss and SSRIs. I'll look it up. <laughs> okay, but, uh, the other sorry, question is about OCD. You didn't talk about that at all. In terms of treatment, do people stay on drugs for that for a long time? Um, does it work? 
Um, Again, I'm afraid it's not, it's not a body of literature I know very well, but just thinking sort of logically about the effects of SSRIs, it's possible if they've got this sort of emotion dampening effect that it might help with OCD, that, it, you know, if people are, um, that it might dampen down the anxiety enough that people don't feel the need to, to go through the obsessional rituals that they go through. Um, so, so I can see some sort of logic of why they might be beneficial, but I haven't looked at the trials in a lot of detail, I'm afraid. That this man has had his hand up as well. <laughs> This on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got into a tremendous row with one of my scientist sons about there had been, uh, you know, there's been a, whole, uh, a couple of uh, very, very uh, prominent uh, mass murders and shootings and things like that. And uh, what had happened is that uh, that there was all this usual hullabaloo about the, the guns, the guns. In it. But uh, I, I somehow I got a, 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 a website or something like that from a gun supporting organization that commented that everyone, apparently somebody did a lot of research, I don't know how they did, found out that all of these people that committed these heinous crimes were on this kind of drug, mind-altering drugs. Now, it makes me think about, well, either it didn't work or it made something even worse, but it's, the, the correlation was, you know, mm. hundreds of cases. Mm. The, guy, mm. and, uh, mm. you know, the one that blew me out of the water was that uh, a couple years ago, some young man stole an airplane and crashed it into a office building in California. And, you, know, so, you know, what is this? You know, that kind of thing. But again, the correlation seemed to be some connection with these mind-altering drugs that were presumably trying to help them with something. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. There's a dark side to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, as, I mean, as I say, the, the problem is that, you know, people who are disturbed in the first place are probably more likely to get put on these medications. Um, but as you point out, it, it, at the very least, it suggests they haven't been helpful for them. Yeah. Hi. So if it's not nutritionally, if it's not uh, an origin of nutrition, that's an issue, which is what this whole conference is about. But if it's, that's not the origin, what would, what, when you're talking about bipolarism or manic depression, what would you consider the origin um, and how, what percentage of the population do you think that is? So um, to deal with the numbers first, the percentage of the population who have serious manic depression or schizophrenia or psychosis um, is, is fairly small. Schizophrenia psychosis, it's said to be about 1%, it's probably a bit less than that. Um, and manic depression is much less common than that, the sort of classical form of it. Um, what do I think causes it? Causes it? Um, I don't think that we'll ever know. I think it's too complicated. I think it's, um, it is just a way that some people are. Um, I don't think we'll ever be able to pinpoint it either in terms of brain chemicals or brain connections or in terms of nutrition. Um, what we do know is that people are much more likely to get these diagnoses if they've had, uh, you, you know, sort of major traumas when they were growing up or, you know, difficult, difficult circumstances. But that's not the case for everyone, so that's not always the cause. Lady there. Thank you so much. Um, just actually um, a secondary question to the nutritional question. Do you have any thoughts on gen genetic mutations um, and certain kind of knowledge that genetic mutations affect um, either aminos or neurotransmitters and lack of that could be causing these problems? Or is that too cutting edge? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the... Uh Lots of people have been looking for the genetics of schizophrenia and the genetics of depression for decades and decades. And what the latest research shows is that there are a huge number of genes, hundreds at least, that, make, that, that increase your risk of getting one of these conditions by a very, very small amount, sort of less than 0.1%. Um, 
I don't think that sort of adds up to much. I don't think that really tells us very much. You know, all it seems to say to me is, well, we're all different. We've all got a different set of genes. Um, we've all got a slightly different risk of getting everything. Um, uh, so so that's, that's what the genetic research shows so far. I don't know whether people have sort of specifically investigated the genetic basis of different, um, uh, you, you know, metabolic pathways. Not, not so far as that they found any definite connections. Anyway. Hi, hi, yes, sorry. Who, who have you spotted? <laughs> hi there, um, I'm Dr. Garinger, and to respond to the genetic part, there's actually a company called um, Pathway Genomics, so these patients are placed on these antidepressants and we're able to, with technology, we're able to go and find out where the mutation comes from and you're able to check the drugs and see the interaction between the drug that these patients are being placed on and how their body metabolizes it. And the sad part is that these um, genetic mental health um, testing is covered by your insurance. And I mean, you know, at my practice, we don't do insurance based just because we're very preventative, and of course it's not covered, but these, I feel like every single therapist that have to put these patients on these medication need to genetically test them and see if they're able to metabolize these medication to lessen the side effects. Please check on genetic mutation. I know there's a lot of stuff out there, so hopefully that helps somebody. Yes, thank you. So, so that's the idea that, you can, that, that there is individual variation in how we metabolize drugs. And, uh, and, and we can look at that to a certain extent genetically. And, you know, yes, it's, it's very useful because that means we can tailor the dose of things uh, according to how people's bodies can, can manage it. about the use of wheat that increase your risk in getting schizophrenia too, right? The, the what, sorry? The use of wheat. Wheat? Yeah, it's also increase your risk to get schizophrenia in long term. But my question is, what happened to the brain when you use morphine or codeine? Nowadays is in everywhere when you go to the dentist, when you go to the emergency rooms, they're giving you morphines the first the, to stabilize it in, 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 I am a doctor in Mexico where you use that. Morphine is for cancer patients, morphine is for uh, higher pain. Mm, and mm, here, mm. they're using for a simple mm, abdominal mm, pain. Mm, so mm. I want you to explain as a psychiatrist, mm. what happened when you use the first time morphine, what happened in your brain, and it gives you risks to be added or it affects in long term, you know, you know what I mean? So thank you. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I would say that, you know, one dose of morphine makes you an addict, but I think there are lots of problems with the widespread pres prescription of opiates that there is in this country. I mean, we know there is that there's, you know, it's one of the highest causes of death in, in young people now, isn't it here? I mean, it might be the highest cause of death, I think. Um, so, you know, so it's a, it's a, I think, a very bad and shocking practice that so many opiates are being prescribed. Um, I don't, you know, yes, they have lots of, of psychological, psychiatric complications, um, uh, but they, they kill people too. Should we have one more question and then, and then shut down? It's one o'clock. I'm sure people are hungry. One more question. Who should take you? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about finding the root causes and a lot of the times people just want to escape their inner brain and their inner thoughts and something that I'm really passionate about is like what you were saying, finding the root cause and trying to change the way your inner voice is um, and I guess just to some people who are having questions maybe about like family members or if they're struggling like 
trying meditation and practices like that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's in your area of research, but I know there has been a few good studies on it, and um, it's been like proven to be very well. I was just wondering if you've seen any research on um, meditation and mental health. I, I don't know, but I work with a colleague who's, who's got a very strong interest in it and who's currently doing a, um, a study of mindfulness. Um, and, and I know that there are several studies of mindfulness and meditation and mental health problems. I think, I think it leads to a really important point. There are lots of aspects of modern day life that are going to make many people mentally ill. You know, we, we live in a terribly competitive society. Everyone's working all hours. We don't, you know, have enough time to, to look after ourselves, to do nice things, to interact. We're often um, a long way from our family, friends. Um, a lot of people don't, you know, don't have enough money, um, don't have secure housing, don't have secure employment. So there are lots and lots of things that are going to, um, you know, increase people's risk of getting mental health problems. And I think anything that people can do to, well, we need to, we need to change society and deal with some of those root problems. But in the meantime, things like meditation and looking after yourself and having a good diet and exercise are all going to be helpful. Thank you.